In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of death. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, may be truly wise, and never rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Father Bruno Lanteri, pray for us. Saint Ignatius, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This brief catechetical moment on prayer is somewhat parallel to what we said earlier with respect to the Christological titles. I gave you five Christological titles, but there are many more. I gave you Christ. I gave you, obviously, Jesus a name. I gave you also the Good Shepherd. Also, Jesus is Il Amigo Kinukafaya, the friend that will never fail us. But there are many more. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to discover in prayer which of those titles seems to captivate us most right now. In other words, the question that Jesus made in Caesarea Philippi, who do people say I am? Who do you people say I am? So make that Christological question that was made in Caesarea Philippi, make that your question. That's uh, the essence of this day. We're focusing upon Christ. So what would be the, the parallel, somewhat parallel to the Christological titles? This you find in the diary of St. Faustina. Meditate upon the attributes of God. Remember years ago when I was in Italy, I had a, um, obviously had Italian formators and formator made this comment, um, you Americans are very different than the Italians. Very different. He said that the, the, the Italians see Jesus as mi amico, my friend. Whereas the Americans, the transcendentals. And that's what we're arriving at now. The transcendental. And these are, and he said this, you know, not that the Italians are wrong, the Americans are wrong, it's just a different cultural perspective. So I have you suspend the air. What, what do you mean by the attributes of God? Well, I'll tell you now. Okay. Are you listening? Yes. Okay, good. God, by his nature, is infinite. You know what that means? Okay. It's the, it's the opposite, opposite of finite. <laughs> like numbers have no beginning, knowing they're infinite. God has no beginning, no end. Jesus told St. Faustina to meditate upon that. With his infinitude is his eternal. Then, God is omnipotent. Omnipotent. That means God is all powerful. God 
God can create the mountains and he can cast the mountains into the sea. In a split instant. God is all wise. God is omniscient. What that means? Omniscient means God knows everything. It's interesting that Faustina says this because Ignatius in one of his meditation, the exercises, says contrast these attributes to God of God and how were the exact opposite? Or everything but powerful. How much do we know? Very little. Where were you? Where were you 70 years ago? Most of you didn't even exist. A few of you did, right? Where were all of you people 100 years ago? <laughs> I got you, Patrick. Okay. okay. <laughs> he was kind of gloating when they said 70 because he was... Uh, he was a teenager, right? <laughs> and God is all loving. So these are attributes. These are qualities that describe who God is. So put that with God as, a, as, our, as our friend. I think we've got a winner. If it's just God as our amigito, it becomes trivial, okay? It becomes trivial. But if it's God is all these attributes, without the personal side, it becomes too distant. So there has to be a harmonious blend of the two. God as friend, and God as transcendental, as omnipotent, eternal, infinite. Got me? So that can help us. All these little catechetical moments are meant to help us to really grow in our prayer life. Or our prayer life, at the end of these exercises, is going to be very robust and better educated. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, how was the wedding feast of Cana? How was the wine? Did you taste it? Okay, uh, as I said earlier, um, some of these contemplation can be so touching that there's no reason why you can go back and revisit them again. So you talk this out with your spiritual director to see where you are. Uh, I'm going at my pace and everyone has to move at the pace that the Holy Spirit is, uh, is working with you. So I'm going to move into the third luminous mystery. And that is the proclamation of the kingdom. And it's the call to conversion. The proclamation of the kingdom and the call to conversion. Of the mysteries, the luminous mystery, this has always been the most nebulous for me in the sense that it's not as clear as the other ones. So, um, so I'll give you um, one detail that's touched me since John Paul II introduced this in 17 years ago, right? 2002. 
it's, uh, this is the very heart of the public life of Christ. The public life of Christ can be divided into two cate three categories. Abundant preaching, Jesus working miracles, and Jesus carrying out exorcisms, casting out devils. So those three years of his public life were absorbed in those three very busy activities. He's constantly preaching, takes almost any opportunity to preach in the synagogue, in the temple, on the seashore, in the boat of Peter, and from the cross, as Bolton Sheen says. Miracles are not lacking over nature or healing the sick. And he's constantly in, in battle with the, with the devil, you know, starting with his temptations in the desert, 40 days. So, the proclamation of the kingdom can be found, the essence can be found in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the most extensive, the largest content of Jesus is preaching altogether. For example, if you take someone like the Gospel of Mark, you see Jesus, he's preaching and then he's doing a miracle and then he's casting out a devil, whereas the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, nonstop. So with respect to um, block of teaching, that's probably the very heart, heart of it. And it's very, very radical, many of the things that he said. Very radical. Said Jesus says it was... It was said, you shall not commit adultery, but he who looks at a woman with lust is already committing adultery. <laughs> wow. I've heard it say, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but if someone smacks you in the cheek, hey, turn the other. Whew. Didn't find that in the Old Testament, did you? No? Very radical. So Jesus is He's really raising the bar. <laughs> He's really raising the bar. So with that, I'd like you to uh, meditate upon. In the Sermon on the Mount, I'd like you to meditate upon the Beatitudes. the Beatitudes. They can be found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. I like what John Paul II says. So the Beatitudes are, are, are a, mirror, a mirror into the heart of Christ. So if you want to see the heart of Christ, what, it, what the heart of Christ was, was like, the sentiments, the Beatitudes. So we're begging for the grace of what? Intimate knowledge of Jesus. We really want to get to know Jesus is through the Beatitudes. Intimate knowledge of Jesus that we love him more ardently and we follow him more closely. These are sentiments of the heart of Christ. We are followers of Christ, so we should beg for the same sentiments. I repeat, we're followers of Christ, right? We call ourselves Christian Catholics, Catholic Christians. So, we want to assume and to put into practice the same sentiments 
that we meditate in our teacher, our model, our guide. He is the way, the truth, and the life. His name is Jesus Christ. So are we ready? Blessed are the poor. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'll let you go through these quickly and just give you an idea on each. Let's go back to principle and foundation and holy indifference again. <laughs> is your heart still cluttered with some, some things? Is your heart still cluttered? Did you ever go into your garage or your attic and you notice it had to be cleaned out? Hello? Is your heart like that attic, like that garage? Hello? Well, okay. Spring cleaning or summer cleaning, huh? Get the broom and sweep it out. Yeah. Okay. What I've done, because I've preached on this before, is um, you can even invite the, the saints to help you out. Each one of the Beatitudes, I'll give you a saint that I think um, exemplifies, uh, exemplifies one of these Beatitudes. Okay, blessed are the poor. Okay, take St. Francis of Assisi. He's the most famous saint outside the Bible, St. Francis. Was he attached at one point of his life? His father would be the owner of Nordstrom's. Yeah, he, his father owned a very, very wealthy um, cloth industry. He sold clothes, no? Very elegant clothes. St. Francis really was a dandy boy, huh? He really liked to dress elegantly. Huh? He get, and he gave up everything. He decided to wear rags. No? He actually traded his clothes for the clothes of a leper. That was when his conversion really came about. How many of you would go out and change your clothes with one of those homeless or a beggar? Okay, at, at the end of the retreat, we'll all go walking through the streets, okay? <laughs> Somebody's saying, you go first, Father, okay. <laughs> Me and Brother Jonas, we'll go together, okay? <laughs> okay blessed are those who, who mourn or weep. Okay, three times in the Bible we see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I'd like to have gathered you the way a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have me. Then he wept at the tomb of Lazarus today, right? Fulton Sheen also points out he wept in the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweat blood. How about the Blessed Mother? In Italy, there's an approved apparition at Siracusa, where a lady actually wept. In um, Akita, Akita is the apparition of a lady in Japan in 1973. She actually wept blood. And the tabernacle that we have in St. Peter's Chanel in the old church was sent by Mrs. Joan Broom, know who she is? My mother, <laughs> from the La Salette Fathers of New Hampshire. Our Lady of La Salette, she wept. 
So you have the tears of Jesus and the tears of Mary. And this weeping is especially because of our sins and the sins of the world. We, for our sins and we weep for the sins of the world, we will be comforted. Saint Monica would be an example. She wept profusely the sins of her son and he was converted. His name is Saint Augustine. He blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice or holiness. They will be filled. And you, you can put in parentheses all the saints. All the saints had a real hunger, had a real hunger to be holy. And listen to Fulton Sheen today in the rectory at about one, 1.30. He made this comment, the only way we're going to transform this world is when each and every one of us makes a firm decision that you are going to become a saint. I repeat, the only way, not pointing your finger at your neighbor or at politics or ideologies or school systems or whatever. It's when you, as a result of this retreat, you make the decision, I'm going to become a saint. That's principle and foundation. Salvation of soul is the same thing as wanting to become a saint. Amen? Amen. Beg the saints for that grace. Beg Mary, the queen of the saints, for that grace. Beg Jesus, the king of all the saints, for that grace. Blessed are the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. The whole gospel is a manifestation of mercy incarnate in Jesus Christ. But one of the best examples, of course, is as Jesus hangs on the cross and his first word from the cross is after he is beaten to a pulp. He is a living, gaping, dripping, bloody wound. He says, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. Can you give me a better example than that? Okay, I'll give you a human example. May 13, 1981, the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, John Paul II was shot. December 24th, the same year, John Paul II is in the prison forgiving this man that tried to kill him. Of all the virtuous actions of John Paul II, I think that's number one. And it's a pure manifestation of mercy and millions if not billions of people saw that. I would say, I would say probably 75% of the world knows about that, even, even non-believers. They, they can put two and two together. Mercy, John Paul II represents Christ. What a beautiful example. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God.
Many examples of this. One of the best in the past hundred years would be the example of St. Maria Goretti. Heard of her? St. Maria Goretti. And if we really want to attain a contemplative life where we're contemplating God, we have to strive for purity. It's not simply sexual purity, it's purity of our eyes, of our thought process, of our intentions, of our feelings. No. We have to allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn away the dross. Let the Holy Spirit burn it away. The crud. <laughs> so we can contemplate the face of God in this life and for all eternity. Yeah. Blessed are the meek. Only once in the New Testament do we have the description of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Matthew 11, 28 to 30, in which Jesus himself describes his heart using two words. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And as I've said in the exercise, meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion under control. Okay. Meekness is not weakness, like being a mousy person. But meekness is not weakness, but powerful emotion. Emotion. We all have an emotional, but under control. And the saint that I've uh, taken for this, I'm not going to explain his life in detail because I don't have time, but obviously St. Francis de Sales. St. Francis de Sales, who really had to strive and struggle for meekness. Meekness is related to patience. Are you patient? Hello? We probably have to work on that, don't we? The blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus appears to the apostles on the day that he rose from the dead at night and he passes through the upper room and he says, Shalom. Shalom, which means peace be with you. You can take St. Elizabeth of Hungary. You can take St. Dominic Savio. You can take St. Francis and his, the famous prayer that's attributed to him, make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your peace. And as Father John Lyons once said, if you live out the first The first Beatitudes, the last one, is a gift, a recompense for living out the first seven. And that would be blessed are the persecuted. The example would be Jesus on the cross. Not only was he persecuted, but he was killed. Who can we take that exemplifies this? all of the martyrs. 
you might take the martyrs of Mexico who said, que viva Cristo Rey, Miguel Pro. Que viva Cristo Rey, que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. Those are the ones that exemplify, blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what we've done in this, if you really want to get to know Christ and to get to know the sentiments of the heart of Christ, you have to go deep into the Beatitudes. So let's ask the Blessed Mother to help us to penetrate the depths of the heart of Jesus Christ. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and bless the fruit of our womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. St. Ignatius, pray for us. Amen.